In this video, we're going to take a look at adaptive springs inside of Autodesk Inventor to dynamically show expansion and contraction in the assembly environment. Here I have a dampener assembly consisting of a few parts, a few nuts and bolts, and tie rods keeping this together. On one end, I already have some adaptive springs already created as an end result. And in this tutorial, we're going to take a look at the top and add some springs on the other side. Now, in this particular case, the spring is driven by a drive constraint, which has uh, very simply been set up with the mate between the blue um, inner cylinder and the bottom plate. Here I call the assembly constraint drive spring, so I can easily find it again. I'll go here and drive this constraint after I examine here the uh, offsets. Okay, it's currently at 65 millimeters. Let's go ahead and drive that. I'm going to drive this from a 65 millimeter value back to 30. And there you can see the contraction of the spring. Plate forward, there's the expansion of this coiled spring. And this is something you can also record out if you want to save this for a presentation file um, to show in a PowerPoint. But the magic about what drives this is that little drive adaptivity box you see there. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But here I can see my repetitions and I can adjust this to have it cycle back and through a couple times. So let's take a look at the top here and add some new springs in. I'm going to go ahead and create a new component. I'm going to call this one an upper spring. And I do want to keep these two springs separate. I want two different types of adaptive parts here. There's actually a lot of rules for adaptivity, and one of them is you can only have an adaptive instance um, update in one way inside of an assembly. So if I had the dampener spring on the bottom side changing more than the top side, then the adaptivity would not work. So I need to have two separate parts in order to make this work, so I can have different springs sized differently on each side. So maybe one side's contracted and one side's expanded. But here I went ahead and created the new component, and I have the upper spring component. I went ahead and started a new component here with a sketch starting on that bottom face inside of the dampener there. I'm just going to finish that sketch quick. And I'm going to create a work plane on this bottom face down here. I'm just going to offset it zero. And I also want to create another work plane where I want this to terminate for the spring on the very top also offset of zero. And these are both adaptive work planes. You notice they put that adaptivity symbol in front of not only the upper spring part, but also the work plane one and work plane two. Next up, I'm going to create a coil that's going to be built between these two work planes. Here, I just reordered it to after the work plane because I actually want to use those work planes for projected references inside of my sketch. Now this sketch so far is uh, actually on the wrong plane. Um, I might as well just delete that one and recreate another one here actually. Let me do a, let's see, YZ. Now I can use project geometry to project those work planes that I want. You can see an orange line there showing my projected reference. The same thing at the top when I get that work plane. I'm going to go ahead and dimension these now. 
And you might be saying, well, that doesn't make sense. Why should I dimension that? That's just going to create an overdriven or over-constrained dimension. It's going to be a driven value. Well, that's fine. That's exactly what I want. You can see here I can't change that value because it's driven by that projected geometry. Let's go in here and go ahead and add my diameter for my coil. Let's make that 3. And then I want my offset from the center point. Let's do 12 and a half. I'm going to go to my parameters box now and make some things a little bit more intelligent for me to understand here. Uh, D1, D2, and D0, yeah, they're, they're great uh, numbers there, but they're very hard to understand if you're trying to do some programming. So I'm going to rename this one and call it uh, height or maybe uh, spring height. Go ahead and finish the sketch, start my coil command. I'm going to pick that profile, which actually it's picked automatically because it's my only one. And my axis here will be my z-axis on the sketch. I'm going to choose how many uh, revolutions in height that I want. I'm going to choose a couple revolutions here. Let's do nine. And for height, this is the most critical portion. I'm actually going to link this to that reference dimension, that spring height value that I created. Another great reason to rename parameters so you can find them easy in dialog boxes. Say OK to that, and there's my spring. I'm not done yet, though. I actually want to lop off the top and bottom of these to make them grounded. So I'm going to use my split tool to actually trim that solid from that side of the work plane to ground off that end. Now, I probably should have had some, like two or three coils on each side. Uh, compress slightly a little bit, you know, for more realistic springs here, but you guys get the idea. If you want to create a different type of spring with your coil command, go right ahead. Um, this is just a quick and easy one. So there's my grounded ends there. Turn off the visibility as work planes. I don't need to see those anymore. So there's my spring. You know, feel free to change the material on that, uh, make it look chrome if you'd like. What I'm going to do it right now, though, is I'm actually going to pattern that. And on that dampener assembly, I have a circular pattern in there. So what's great about that is I can use an associative pattern reference. So it's automatically going to pick up the count and uh, the pattern direction for that spring based on a pattern that's actually inside of the part file on that top plate. Okay, here I have another drive spring constraint. This is something I had created earlier. It's currently a 65, and now you can see when I drive it, those springs don't compress. Like, oh, Mark, you uh, wasted this entire tutorial showing me this. No, you got to make sure that drive adaptivity is turned on. Now, once that drive adaptivity is turned on, that will drive that as it's going through that constraint, which is feeding back into the part file for the projected geometry to change the height of that coil. And here I can change that to 45, and on the bottom, you can see that has not changed. So I'm driving two separate instances of adaptivity with two separate part files. Now what, what about uh, build material tracking? Because I have two separate parts, but I really just want uh, you know one spring to show up in my count. Instead of six on the top and six on the bottom, I want 12 to show up. So let me go ahead and save these files so they actually get saved into the bill. And what I'm going to do here is make sure the part numbers match. Because with my bill material settings, I have it so that when the part numbers match, they will merge into the same count. So if I look at my structured bomb, I can see I have a count of 12 of the part number 102650. But yes, they are two separate files for the purpose of what I want to show.
And then here I can also quickly change the material. Let's just change it to mild steel. And save. There you have it.